Hello, everybody. Uh, we're back with the second half of chapter three. Chapter three is all about water and why water is so cool and especially important for biological systems. Um, you know, we talked earlier about the three, um, sorry, three out of the four reasons why water is important in biology. The last one is this up here. Water is the universal solvent. I'll go over that in a second. And then we just get to pH and then it's basically over. So I'm starting on, uh, looks like page 48 in the 10th edition. Um, you should have a handout too. This is what I would have given you in class and uh, feel free to go along um, and mark some, uh, mark some stuff on here if you need to. I, I felt um, that it's first important to talk about water and uh, the Vale Valley. We are at the head of the water table for a lot of people that uh, depend on our water downstream, Phoenix, Vegas, LA, all those fields down there and those people. And so um, I thought it'd be important to take a look and see where we're at uh, as far as water, uh, snow, sorry, water equivalency in the precipitation that has fallen to the ground here. If you look here, this is Vale Mountain. Um, there's a survey site on the side of Vale Mountain. This is for 2020. The black line represents average. Uh, the blue line represents uh, this year. And then the red line represents the, the lowest year on record over the last, I think it's like 58 years or something they have data for. They just go out there at this one sampling site on Vale Mountain. And they have it at Tennessee Pass and Copper Mountain and other mountains too. And then they basically, they plunge this thing into the ground. They pull out what's there. They melt it. And they see how much water is there. And they say on this date, that's how much water's there. And they try to figure it all out, but just to get a picture of how um, water's doing. And then it helps people plan for the summer, how much water is going to come downstream for the farmers and everything. And people have water rights and they say, well, I have rights to that water. Um, my grandpa got the rights in 1905 or whatever. So anyway, it's really complicated, but it's really interesting. And a few students have gotten into this. Um, who have come out of Battle Mountain High School. So we see here that 2020 is kind of a low average for Vail Mountain. You see that right there. You see that 2019 was uh, better, um, fairly average, let's say, for Vail Mountain. Uh, 2018, you may recall, was a super low uh, snow winter for us, almost near the lowest on record. And then 2017 was bad um, also. You know, where 2017 was really bad was out on the West Coast. And I talked to Stuart Howard um, about this former student, and uh, his mom was running um, North Star Resort out there in Truckee, California. And he said they hadn't had snow for years. Um, and uh, it was a really um, scary time for a lot of the business owners and for a lot of people who enjoyed skiing and uh, their lives depended on it. In fact, here is a, a picture. Uh, January at Squaw Valley Resort, which um, usually has reliable snow. And then they really had to start rationing water out in California. This is 2017. But the point is that this may be our future unless we can figure out something. I'm going to show you a movie now for about you know 10 seconds, but I'd like you to watch it on your own. Go ahead and press pause on this and watch this movie, please. It's been said that the wars of the 21st century may well be fought over water. All right, there's your little sampling. So um, let's finish uh, here. Just understand that when you have water and you put something in it, you're making a solution. This is the solvent. This is the solute. We're going to start to deal with this a lot more solutes because they are things that are in our body and our body is a liquid medium. 70% of us is water and our bloodstream is and cells are and everything. And so so solutes go into solvents to make solutions. So this is a sol, this is a solute. And what, what science has found is that more things dissolve in water than anything else. And uh, I don't, well, I, I have an idea why that is. I'm about to share that with you, but I don't know why it has come to be that way. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, it's due to its polarity. And you probably, uh, I figured this out because it's the same as everything else in this chapter. It's due to the hydrogen bonding between adjacent water molecules because there's a partial positive or negative charge on those water molecules. And you can see that there on the screen, how the water molecules are orienting their positive, partially positively negative or positive sides towards one another. And um, it allows it to form a hydrogen bonds not only with itself, but with other things. And that's how it dissolves these other things. So here's an example. We have sodium chloride here. That would be the big uh, yellow and green thing um, on your picture. Uh, this is Those are sodium ions and chloride ions, which are ionically bonded to one another. 
And then you can see how um, you can see how the water can come around and surround these ions and kind of break them away from the larger crystal. Um, so go ahead and press pause and try to explain how this happens and use the term hydrogen bonding. Well, this is called a hydration shell. Um, when uh, when you can see here, what's interesting is that the um, is that the water molecules are orienting themselves so that they're, for instance, around the chloride ion. You can see that the partial positive charge of each water molecule is orienting itself so that those are the hydrogen um, atoms of the water molecule. So that those are the things that are orienting around it. I wish I could point at stuff, but I can't. Um, and uh, you can see on the sodium ion that the negatively, partially negatively tended side of the water molecule, which would be the oxygen atom side, that's what's facing the sodium ion. If you can't see this, uh, ask me. I'd love to help you. I just can't point through the screen, unfortunately. Um, here you see it again, and then I have a little movie where I can show you how this works. Sodium chloride crystals are held together by attractive forces between the positively charged sodium and negatively charged chloride ions. When a crystal of sodium chloride is placed into water, the hydrogen ends of polar water molecules attract the negatively charged chloride ions and gradually surround them. Likewise, the oxygen ends of water molecules are attracted to and surround the positively charged sodium ions. The hydrated ions drift away into the solution, allowing new water molecules to surround newly exposed ions. Gradually, the entire crystal dissociates into solution. That's how, so <clears throat> obviously the sodium and uh, chloride ions are still there, but we say that it's dissolved because we can no longer see the salt. Um, uh, I have a figure, I'm sorry, I have an, an example of this. I'm going to turn this screen. Hopefully you can see this. I have a, I have a beaker over here that uh, has a little magnetic stir bar in it. <laughs> I hope that you can see this. Maybe you can't. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to pour some water into this. And let's, let's watch it dissolve over time. I pour some salt into the water. And um, all we're doing is we're agitating the... Um, the water molecules so much that they're getting inside of the salt crystal and then eventually they will just do uh, what we just talked about, the hydration shell and dissociate those ions from one another. So over time, all that salt will, what we would call dissolve. So I'll, I'll leave the camera where it is for a moment. Um, so uh, just understand that there are hydrophobic and hydrophilic molecules out there as well. And we're going to be dealing with these in biology. Um, an example of something that's a hydrophobic means it's scared of water and hydrophilic means love water, hydrophilic. So uh, as far as um, hydrophobic compounds, things like oils, fats, waxes, any type of lipid, something like this, you've seen oil before, you know that these things don't dissolve in water. Do you know why? Well, let me tell you why. Because, let me pour some in here and, and you'll see. It's because it has no polarity. What's happening here in any sort of oil or fat or wax is that we don't hear, so we're gonna learn uh, what, what this little structure means, but what the idea is, is that um, is that every kink on there is a carbon, and you'll learn this in chapter four, and there's hydrogens coming off, but the idea is, is that there's, it's totally nonpolar, which means all of the electrons are being shared equally. That's the take home message here, between all the carbons and all the hydrogens which they're bound to. Because there's no polarity, water, which is super polar, wants to kind of orient itself, the water molecules, just like it did with the sodium and chloride ions in the sodium chloride, but it can't do that. And you, then you can see here that there's like this layer of oil on top of the water. You've seen this before. Uh, you know that oil and water don't mix. And that's the reason why is because water's polar and fats, oils, and waxes are non-polar. They have non-polar bonds. Well, I've left uh, the, the camera over here because
wanted to show you um, what happens when you pour a hydrophilic molecule into water. This is a polar molecule. I have some uh, cane sugar here. This is what it looks like. And you can imagine that everywhere that you see an oxygen here bound to a hydrogen, that it's a nonpolar bond. They're not sharing electrons equally through their covalent bond. And so every, every hydrogen atom here is going to be partially positively charged that have a positive dipole on it. And every oxygen here is going to have a partial negative charge. Now, the overall molecule of sucrose, table sugar, is going to be electrically neutral. Just remember, just like the water molecule, it just has kind of sides that are a little bit more positive and a little bit more negative. So my question on the previous slide was, how does this happen? So think about it as I pour this in here. So I poured a lot of sugar in there. How does this happen? How does it dissolve? Well, here's your answer. It's the same way that the, um, the water molecules dissolve the chloride and sodium ions in the sodium chloride, is that they just kind of orient themselves around it. I, I think the sugar is still there, but um, it's just broken apart these large crystals that were in the bag that we could originally see now that they're broken apart. Wouldn't it be great if you can't see any of this? I just know that sugar dissolves in water. So does salt. Uh, there's nothing there any longer. Go ahead and pause for a moment and ponder these two things. Please. All right, we could go through the whole pH scale. And I would like you to, I'd like you on this handout that you have, to take a look at the pH scale and really study it. Press pause for a moment. What do you notice on the left side of the arrow that's in the, I guess the black bar that's in the middle and on the right side, what are you seeing there? What do you know about pH? pH is, sorry, pH is super important. Of course. Sorry. Um, uh, pH is super important when it comes to biological systems. Um, you know, you probably know that the neutral pH of water is 7, and um, the pH of human blood is about 7.4, and that's really important that, that we are going to try to keep our pH at, at that appropriate level. You've probably used um, pH papers in the past, and when you come to class, we'll definitely, if that happens, I hope it does, uh, we'll definitely play around with some acids and some bases. Well, um, press pause, ponder this if you haven't already, and I, I've asked you to uh, explain the most important points to your neighbor, but we're going to move on, and I'm going to tell you how this works. So um, what happens with pH is that pH is just a measure of the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution, and what we, what we see over here is that is that uh, if you get two water molecules that come together, and you can see that up on the screen, sometimes they'll dissociate into an H3O and an OH. And this H3O, I like to think of as an H+, plus, um, because what's extra on this water molecule, H2O, is just an extra H. So that's a hydrogen ion and a sodium, and a, sorry, sorry, a hydroxide ion. Now, we can measure how many of these things, uh, these water molecules have dissociated in a solution, and that will give us an indication of the pH of that solution. So an acid, is anything that increases the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution? Here's what we mean. This is hydrochloric acid. It has a pH of 1, 
And all that means is that it has a lot of, it has, so basically this is just water. And then someone, and I've, I've made this stuff before for class. You take these um, terrible, they're like uh, white pills, essentially. You're not going to eat them, but you just dissolve them in the water. And then they give the water a ton of H pluses. Conversely, you can make a base. You can just get tap water, pH of seven. You take this, this tablet that has a ton of hydroxide ions on it and you put it in here. Now, if you were to, obviously you have to have gloves because if you were to touch that stuff, the, hydro, the hydroxide ions, the OH negatives want to react with anything they can. They want to get um, positively charged ions and maybe from your skin. And that's why your skin will, I guess, rot away. You know, if I took this base or I took that acid and I stuck my finger in here at pH of one, or this is pH of 14. Um, if I stuck my finger in here for a minute and then I pulled my finger out, it essentially, it, I would have a burn or, you know, it would eat away at my flesh because the uh, ions are just trying to, to tear away as much stuff as possible. Good stuff there. Huh? You're going to have to know a little bit about this for the test. Um, and so here's our little pictures of the basic solution with more OHs than H pluses. And then you can see the acidic solution which with more hydrogen ions than OH negatives or hydroxide ions. Um, Here's our, uh, I don't know if, if I've had class with you yet, but I'm just taping this in July. Um, uh, so I will have already given you this sheet or not, but um, you have to understand that on the AP biology test in May, they're gonna give you this form and any one of these formulas are fair game for you to use and be held accountable for during the exam. So we're gonna go over all of these throughout the year. We're gonna relate them to biology. We're gonna do stuff with them, but the first one, at least as far as I know uh, right now, is that we're gonna go over is this, and I want you to write this down uh, because we're gonna do a couple problems here. So get out a piece of scratch paper, please. Um, it says that pH is negative log of H plus. So what does this mean here? Um, actually, let's go back to this. Let, let's do a couple problems. So I'm not the biggest math person, but I do know some math. Uh, let, me, let me fall flat on my face right now. Um, pH of seven, regular water, neutral, right? What does that mean? Well, what this means is it's pH of negative log of one times 10 to the negative seven hydrogen ions. So that's, the, we're talking about hydrogen ions here. And so what that means is if you write the number one and then you go um, logarithmic lead to the left here to go negative seven places over. So I'm gonna put a decimal point here of 1.0, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'll put a new decimal point. I'm going to fill in the zeros there. Basically what you're saying is that this is the concentration of hydro, uh, hydrogen ions per water molecules. Or you could rewrite this as 1 over, what is this? I have it written down. 10 million. 1 over 10 million. So what this is saying here is that for every 10 million water molecules, you have one hydrogen ion. That's what that's saying. That's water, and that's fine. That's what we're mostly made of. The question is, how much more acidic is a pH of 4 than a pH of 7? Go ahead and try to answer this. Because this is a logarithmic scale, we're going up or down by tens, right? So. Um, a pH of four, so if we count the arrows here, a pH of six is 10 times more acidic than seven. pH of five is 10 times more acidic even than six. And a pH four is 10 times more acidic than five. So if you multiply these together, you get a thousand, right? So a pH of seven is a thousand times more basic than a pH of four. Or you could say a pH of four is a thousand times more acidic than a pH of seven. So let's prove that. So let's do the math here. One times ten to the negative fourth. That's all I've written up there. So let's. So this would be one. Four. So this means that one out of got this written down. One out of every ten thousand. molecules in this solution is a hydrogen ion. So I've just written up here, for every 10,000 water molecules, we have one hydrogen ion. Now, is that a thousand times 
more acidic than this guy. Well, this was one out of every 10 million, and now we're at 10,000. So if we were to take one, two, three, and so now these are equal, and that one, two, three would be representative of that 1,000 times um, greater or less, depending if you're going more acidic or less acidic. What about a pH of one? That stuff that I, uh, hydrochloric acid that I had earlier, that would be one, um, pH is equal to negative log of one times 10 to the negative one. And what that means is, that means one out of every 10 molecules in there, I guess the hydrogen ion isn't a molecule, but one out of every 10 things is a hydrogen ion. Uh, and there's your water molecule. So that has a lot of hydrogen ions. That makes sense then if you stuck your finger in there that there's many more of those things that could bind to stuff on your finger and cause it to burn. Well, just understand, excuse me, that basicity is going the opposite direction. So how many more times basic is, the, is something with a pH of 9 than pH of 5? So that's 10, 100,000, 10,000. So it's 10,000 more times this. So that's how that works. Um, we're going to do a couple of uh, problems in class. I'll give you some problems in the book. You'll see this on the exam um, for sure. I, don't, I told you earlier in Chapter 3, I don't want you to read the whole thing because I think they go way too deep into this, but this is the level at which you need to know because the College Board is telling us so. Uh, there's a last little bit on this um, on uh, the um, ocean acidification, which I've already touched on. But we're going to go over it again. It's that important. You'll probably see it on your test, too. But first, understand that uh, buffers are things that we actually create buffers in our lungs, this white powder. Um, uh, this is an example of a buffer, that, this right here, this bicarbonate ion. So I just have this, this chemical formula, uh, which I have a picture of at the beginning, and you'll see it in Mr. Anderson's movie right now. But when you add carbon dioxide and water, you get... Um, this intermediate, and then that dissociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. And the point is that we create this stuff in our body, HCO3 negative, in order to bind up any extra H pluses that are out there to try to keep our pH at a solid level. Warming, how increases in the amount of carbon dioxide is warming the planet, but you may not be familiar with global warming's evil twin, ocean acidification. The cause is the same, increases in the amount of carbon dioxide, but the mechanism is different. Let me show you a demonstration. This is regular distilled water, and I'm going to use a pH meter to measure the pH of regular H2O, and it's going to be right around 7. Now I'm going to take that same distilled water, we're going to put it in a bottle, and we're going to add carbon dioxide to it. We're using a soda stream machine to shoot carbon dioxide in it. It's now just carbonated water. We're going to put it in a glass, and we're going to measure the pH now. I want you to make a prediction of what you think the pH might be. You can even use your finger and point on the screen to where the pH scale is going to be. Let's see how you did. The pH is going to be 3.6. It's really acidic. Let me show you what's going on. So if we take carbon dioxide and water and mix them together, we get carbonic acid. Now that can quickly dissociate and form bicarbonate. What we're doing here is we're losing one of these hydrogen ions, and that can dissociate again, and we can form carbonate. We're losing two of these hydrogen ions. Now if we look at the definition for what pH is, pH, remember, is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. What does that mean? The more of this H plus that we have in solution, the lower the pH is going to be, and it's going to be more acidic. If we add more carbon dioxide, more of it's going to move in, and we're going to have more of this hydrogen ion, and we're going to have a lower pH. Now, the levels of each of these can change. Each of these are reversible reactions, so depending on the amount of carbon dioxide, it can move towards the left or it can move towards the right. Why is this a big deal? Well, life exists in this water, and life is regulated by proteins, and proteins require a specific pH. So studies are showing that if we decrease the pH and make it more acidic, organisms are having a decrease in metabolism and they can have a decrease in their immune response as well. Now how much of a change in pH are we seeing? If we look at pre-industrial levels, the pH of the oceans was really basic, 8.25. Post-industrialization, it had changed to 8.14. Now there are going to be regional differences you can see on this map right here. And you might say that's not much of a change in pH, 0.11, but remember this is a log scale. So that represents a 30% change 
in the pH. What's it going to look like in the future? Well, if we play those models out into the future, by 2100, it could be as low as 7.80. And this low pH is going to devastate ecosystems for a different reason. This last carbon compound of the three is carbonate. That combines with calcium to form calcium carbonate. That's what the shell is made up of. That's what the bulk of a coral reef is made up of. And as we change the pH, we can change the level of that carbonate. What determines the concentration of these three? Well, it's going to be the temperature of the ocean water, the alkalinity, but also the pH. So we can use a Jerome plot to figure out what's going to happen over time. These are log scales of the concentration of these three compounds. The green represents the amount of carbonic acid. The red line represents the amount of bicarbonate. And then the black line represents the amount of carbonate. Remember, that's important for shells. And so if we look at it at acidic levels, uh, carbonic acid is going to dominate. At neutral levels, bicarbonate is going to dominate. And then at basic levels, those that we would find in the ocean, carbonate is going to dominate. But this blue area represents what's going to happen as we change the pH. And as we decrease the pH, you can see what's going on. The carbonate levels are going to drop off, and the bicarbonate levels are going to increase. That's because that free hydrogen is competing with the shellfish, really. The free hydrogen is competing with that calcium carbonate to form more bicarbonate. And so now shells can't make their shells. If we look at what could happen over time, this is a pteropod shell at 7.8 pH. It is literally going to dissolve. And so if we look at, uh, for example, coral reefs, they're getting hit with a double whammy. We've got global warming and increasing the temperature is going to cause them to bleach or kick out all of their algae. I'll talk about that in a different video. But this ocean acidification is going to take that carbonate and so they can literally not build more of the coral reef. And so these two things work together. What's the good part of global warming and ocean acidification? If there is a silver lining, it's that they both have the same cause. It increases in the amount of carbon dioxide. If we can decrease the amount of carbon dioxide, we can cool off our planet, and we can also slow down this ocean acidification. Make sure that you take a look at this uh, picture um, at the back of chapter three. Uh, I've seen it on the AP test before. Thanks for your attention.